bullish sentiment's getting very overbought. Technicals are extremely overbought. Our risk reward ranges that we publish in our newsletter every weekend are extremely extended. You're going to get a correction here. Now, what causes it? Um, there's a lot of catalysts. I mean, the Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart, welcoming you back here at the end of another week, special week this week. It was Thanksgiving, and we obviously have a lot to be grateful for here. I am joined, as usual, by my tryptophan-saturated friend, Lance Roberts. How are you doing, Lance? I'm doing good, and yes, uh, it was uh, quite the fest yesterday. So, yeah, back on the back on the diet wagon today. Yeah, yeah. If either one of us uh, falls asleep in the middle of this conversation, you know, slips into a food coma, folks, don't take it personally. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, look, uh, so it's it's been a bit of an abbreviated week in the markets, obviously, because of the holiday. Um, but they are up for the week. Um, you know, this rally that we've been seeing continues here. I, I, I believe, after talking to you last week, that you are still expecting um, some sort of near-term cooling off here um, before things resume again into the end of the year. Is that still what you're expecting? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've had a, a very big rally here. Markets are overbought short term. Um, and I'm actually writing an article on this uh, exact topic for Tuesday. Uh, so it'll be our Tuesday piece that's coming out on the website. Um, but yeah, going you know through the historical facts, and even if you look at just seasonal data, right? You, know, you see all these charts about seasonality. And it says, okay, well, you know, every year you have this is the seasonal trend from October to December. This is what markets do. Well, if you actually look at that chart, um, you'll see a little dip right at the beginning of December. And the reason for that is that that's when mutual funds have to distribute all their capital gains, dividends, and interest for the year. So you get a bit of selling that comes into the market, particularly when markets are overbought already going into that period. You typically get a bit of correction. Then you get a rally, the Santa Claus rally into the end of the year as all those mutual funds have to basically rebalance their portfolios for the year end window dressing. So, you know, it, it's not anything surprising here that you're gonna get a, a bit of a correction. That'll be a good opportunity to add some more exposure to your portfolio uh, when, when that happens. Okay. Um, so uh, look, you know, as an investor, um, you know, one of the things we talked about last week is that you for much of Q4, had been telling people you thought the risk was more to the upside than the downside. There was a period there in October where we're getting a lot of parade of bad data and yeah. you were getting a lot of pushback uh, saying, Lance, you just don't get it. You're ignoring all this data that's going to drag the market down. Obviously, market didn't get dragged down. It started powering higher again. Um, and now those same people are going, you're talking about a correction. That's never going to happen. This is Onward and upward from here. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, is it that way, or are there people who are still, you know, expecting the wheels to come off coming into the end of the year, and you're basically saying, "No, folks, expect this <laughs> no, more no. Like usual Santa Claus rally." Yeah, no, no, no. My Twitter feed is, is if I, you know, I've been talking about this potential correction now for about a week and a half, two weeks on Twitter, saying, "Hey, you know, this is great. Use this rally as an opportunity to rebalance risk, take some profits, do your tax loss selling." Um, you know, this is a great time to do it. Use this rally for that because we'll get a bit of a correction here. It's like, and so now all the Twitter commentary is like, you don't understand momentum in the markets. This is just going to carry on. We're not okay. over here. And so, yeah, it's, but th this is always the case, right? October lows, everybody's super bearish. Everybody's selling at that point. This is why investors historically always buy low and sell, uh, sorry, sell low and buy high um, because they do exactly the opposite of what they should do when, when markets are, are trading. Bullish sentiment's getting very overbought. Technicals are extremely overbought. Our risk reward ranges that we publish in our newsletter every weekend are extremely extended. You're going to get a correction here. Now, what causes it? Um, there's a lot of catalysts. I mean, the Fed's going to come out and at their next FOMC meeting and say, yeah, we're higher for longer. We're still worried about inflation um, because the market rally is now lo is, is loosening financial conditions, which is exactly not what the Fed wants. So the market's keep doing, you know, keep working against themselves with respect to the Fed. So, you know, that could, you know, uh, the Fed statement is going to be more hawkish than expected, I would imagine. And that's probably going to drag markets down a bit. That may cool things off. Okay. So, so basically everybody's back on the party bus uh, yeah. now that uh, they've realized stocks were going higher. Um, okay. So we're going to hopefully get a chance today to talk about your recent piece, speculator or investor. What's the difference? Um, I mentioned this last week and we just didn't end up having time to get to it. Hopefully, we will this week. But you really talk in there about how emotions 
in many ways, make the biggest obstacle that investors have to success themselves, right? And that's sort of what you're talking about a little bit here. Um, all right, well, look, um, if you can, Lance, why don't you pull up the, the latest chart of the S&P? Let's just sure. look at some of those key levels. Um, I want to uh, I want to get to a couple of things, a couple of other specific assets in just a moment. So before I do, um, let's just look at the technicals here. We're still way elevated above the major moving averages, and I'm sure you're going to talk about, you know, overbought and regression to the mean and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> let me just say, imagine that. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. But 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 let let's say the market just flattens from here. Sure. Right. The longer it flattens, that's actually bullish, right? It gives those right. averages time to catch up to it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, you'll look at like, for instance, just looking at this chart. So the, this kind of shaded, these shaded bars on the right are what's called a Fibonacci retracement sequence. Um, Fibonacci is a, you know, was a mathematician. He discovered what's called this golden ratio that exists throughout the world. We talked about this before, whether it's the length of your elbow to your fingertip or the number of sunflower seeds in a sunflower, uh, the, the, the rings on a, on a conch shell, et cetera, all relate back to these mathematical sequences. Math basically describes everything in the universe. And so what he discovered was is that these specific ratios, these specific percentages just occur repeatedly in nature. And we can apply that to the financial markets because markets typically tend to run within the context of these Fibonacci sequences. And so when you get a big rally, so uh, from the peak to the trough uh, that we had back this summer, we've since almost now recovered 100% of that sell-off because we're nearing the July high. So if this market can keep rallying here for another couple of days, um, you know, we're gonna get to the, the highs for the year. So you know, we've had a, a terrific retracement. And so now we're, we're probably gonna get a pullback to, to some of these kind of percentage retracement levels, which happen to coincide with areas of, of previous resistance that are now support, whether it's a moving average, whether it's a, a previous place where we topped in the market, et cetera, those are now going to provide support for a bit of a pullback. So again, you know, kind of looking at these potential pullback areas uh, are going to give you some idea of where potentially that we can start adding exposure to portfolios. But importantly, if you take a look at the top chart, which is basically just a, a basic uh, moving average convergence divergence indicator, normally known as a MACD, um, that gives you great buy and sell signals for when to add exposure or take exposure off the markets. And uh, right now, that, that indicator is getting very elevated. And we're back to, to kind of the levels we were back in June, where the market started the summer correction. Um, and also, if you take a look at RSI at the bottom, the relative strength index, we're back to, to basically above 70 that is a very overbought level for the market. So again, just, you know, you have to always remember markets are like rubber bands. And, 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 and a good example of this is go back to June. In June, we were looking at this, uh, at this huge run-up that we had in, in March, April, May, and saying, look, we're due for a 5 to a 10% correction. And everybody was like, no, this market's just going up from here. We're already at 15%. We're going to be at 30% by the end of the year. It's going to be fantastic. I was like, look, you're going to get a correction because markets are exceedingly overbought. They're very stretched, deviated from long-term means. You're going to get a correction of 5 to 10%, completely normal with any given market year. And that's exactly what we had. The, the correction from peak to trough was 10.3%. So you're, you, you know, these things just occur over and over in time. And the problem with investors is they always extrapolate what's currently happening based on what their hopes are that this is going to last forever. This market is just going to go up forever. Or conversely, when markets are going down, we now believe that markets just go down forever and, and they're never going to go up again. So I just need to get out of the markets. But this is why investors always repeatedly do the wrong thing for the portfolio at the wrong time. <laughs> okay. Hey, the blue arrows that are there, are uh, those on the most recent buy signal? Is that what those yeah, are? Uh, yeah, ba yeah, basically the blue arrow at the top was the MACD buy signal that we got. Um, right at the end of October. And that was also at the same point that we broke above the 50 day moving average. So those two coincided with each other. So that was your real, that was that point right there. Now, uh, again, you know, we were, we were buying, you know, late October to get ready for this rally. The market started rallying, but your point that was, okay, we're back in a bullish buy signal was the break above that, that triggering of the MACD buy 
and that break above the moving average, because now you've taken kind of the, the, the impediments away from the market to go higher. And since then, markets have just gone higher. Okay, so that's not the same buy signal on two graphs. That's two coincident buy signals, which I'm guessing gave you some confidence, right? Like, oh, we're seeing on multiple well, indicators now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's the way, look, you know, technical analysis, you know, if, if you talk to technical analysts, like, like Sven Heinrich is, is a good example. Great technical analyst, right? He, get, he gets very, you know, he has a million different indicators that he looks at, right? Tom McClellan, same thing. They have a million different indicators they look at. Because their whole focus is that's their their world, right? Is technical analysis. So they understand, you know, all these, you know, different variations of technical analysis and what it means. For the average person, they're going, I don't understand. It's just a bunch of lines on a graph. What does that mean? And this is why we've talked about before, just as an investor, you know, you can be a fundamental investor. That's fine and dandy. No problem with that. You can buy fundamentals. Um, but you got to have at least a little basic knowledge of some very basic technical analysis to help you manage the risk versus the reward of when you're allocating capital or not. So, you know, this is a very basic, you know, chart. It's just two moving averages, the 50 and the 200 day moving average, a MACD and an RSI. And so what you're looking for is, is great. I get a buy signal. And a good example of this is, is if we go back uh, to, to basically early or October, we got a buy signal on the MACD and it's like, okay, we got the buy signal. Let's go. And the market then failed at the 50-day moving average and then went to new lows by the end of the month. Uh, so you didn't have confirmation. You, you had one indicator telling you it was a buy, but you didn't have a confirmation from the other indicators. And so if you can get confirmation from you know, two or three of your indicators to confirm that whatever signal you're getting has been confirmed by another action, gives you a lot higher confidence that you know, you're making the right bet with your money. So, and you're going to be late, you know, you didn't buy the exact bottom, but you know, when the market broke above 50 day, that was a good confirmation that this is probably going to be a buy signal that lasts and you could allocate money to the market and you've made some money since then. So and that's our, that's our goal, right? Our goal is not to try to capture a hundred percent of a market move. If I can get 50% of it, I'm good. Got it. Yeah. And you know, that's similar to sort of the value I see this channel offering is, you know, I talk to all sorts of different experts and, they have different approaches, different methodologies. And I find that when many experts are saying the same thing, it gives me more confidence in the probability of that thing happening because it's like having these multiple different indicators, right? That are just complementing one another. Right. Um, didn't always work, but I think it takes some of the risk out of the system. So looking at this set of uh, data here right now, Lance, um, it, it does not seem uh, that, you know, even though we're at nosebleed levels, it does not seem that sell signals have been triggered yet. Right. But just from your experience, you're saying, hey, when you're up here, obviously, you know, the cyclicality kicks in at some point and you're you're nervous enough about that, that you're prob probably lightening up a little bit right now. No, no. We, well, we already did our tax loss selling. We did that, um, you know, uh, week, uh, during the pre-Thanksgiving week. So, you know, we, we have raised some cash here and we're looking for a bit of a pullback to put that cash to work. But, you know, again, this is just a really good time which is my point, is that you're going to get a pullback. Now, look, the market just could, could go sideways for a week or two, right? It doesn't have to go down. Uh, that's also a correction. Markets don't have to decline to technically be a correction. And But just having a pullback to, you know, uh, either, you know, kind of this previous top level, maybe even the 50-day moving average would be great because, you know, the markets act like a rubber band. And, and, you know, you've had a very strong rally here. You've stretched that rubber band as far as you can. So in order to stretch it again, I need to relax it, then I can stretch it again. So what you need is, is a bit of a, a, a just a, a, a reversion in price to allow buyers to enter back into the markets. You know, as we've always talked about before, you always think about the market as two rooms, buyers and sellers. And at some point, everybody that wants to sell will have sold, or at some point, everybody that wants to buy will buy. And when you get that exhaustion on one side or the other, right now we're nearing a buyer's exhaustion, you're going to get a pullback because sellers will emerge and kind of overwhelm the buyers. Okay. Hey, just, just going with your gut here. I'm not going to hold you to this, yeah. but I'm just curious. <clears throat> what are the odds you think we end the year at new highs for the year? They're pretty, pretty decent at this point. So, I mean, 80%, 90%. Okay. Yep. So we get, you know, if, if it follows the script, you think we get some pullback but then the rally, the Santa Claus rally into the end of the year, you think, you know, could likely be enough to end, end at new highs for the year. 
Yeah, for the for the year. I mean, but you know, again, you're currently trading at you know forty five fifty six. You know, as we're talking right now, since I pulled up this chart, so you get a pullback to say forty four eighty six. Maybe you pull a hundred points off the market. Maybe a hundred and fifty. Maybe two hundred, and then this market rallies and finishes up towards forty six hundred by the end of the year. Completely logical. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me let me segue from that. Unless there's anything else you want to say about sort of the general equity market right now. No. no All go right. Ahead. Well, okay. Keep, keep the chart up for just a second oh. here. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right. Right. Um, right. Go back. All right. If you can pull it up real quick. All I want to just reinforce here is that the S and P has actually, you know, it's done well this year, right? Um, yeah. So uh, it's been on a relatively, I don't want to say steady rise up, but I mean, it's, it's, it's the arc of the year has been up and to the right. Now let's contrast that with a couple of other, um, a couple of other uh, important assets. Um, one is oil, right? Oil right. is basically ending the year where it started. Correct. Yeah. And I'm curious, what, what is that telling you right now? You know, some uh, might say that that is, uh, you know, signs of a recession. Um, some might say it was that, you know, nerves got, uh, you know, over-exaggerated, uh, especially recently with the uh, the issues going on between Israel and, and the Palestinians. Um, but oil is such a key, you know, key input into the economy. And the fact that it actually hasn't gone anywhere this year, I find kind of interesting, even though the markets have powered higher. Well, you also have to remember that energy stocks were up 60% last year when the rest of the market was down 20 so, you know, any, any positive good news you could have had for oil was priced in last year. So, you know, again, so, but yeah, oil prices have definitely corrected. Remember back in June, um, people were talking about oil's going to 150 and- I do. Know, and see $200 barrel of oil. We were actually wrote an article saying, that's probably not gonna be the case. You're gonna see a pretty decent correction in oil. We recommended taking profits in oil. And- that was just because, again, technically prices had gotten too extended and you're going to get this corrective action, and which is exactly what's happened. But look, slower economic growth, which we are having, is going to lead to lower oil prices because oil is a supply demand economy. And, but, you know, prices of oil are driven by the futures market. So if the futures traders are going, hey, I'm looking at, at the economy slowing down here a bit, that probably is going to reduce demand for oil they're going to sell off oil prices, which is which has been what's happening. And again, you know, production is doing fine. The, the you know, the the big fear was that the Israel conflict was going to spark World War Three. We said that probably wasn't going to be the case. It hasn't yet. Doesn't mean it can't. But again, that all this stuff is getting priced in pretty quickly um, to the economy. Now, are we going to have a recession next year? I have no idea, nor does anybody else. But, you know, there's certainly a lot of evidence that or indicators, I should suggest that, you know, like the leading economic index, et cetera, that certainly suggest that we're going to have a much slower rate of economic growth next year, whether or not it's recessionary or not is yet to be seen. But that if you do have that, you are going to sleep, see, sorry, you're going to see um, slower demand for, for oil prices, and that's going to bring oil prices down. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's so interesting, right? So. Totally agree with you. And we can say, look, you know, oil, important leading indicator for the market. And if we see oil prices going down, especially surprising people on the downside, that's probably an indicator the economy is slowing or going to, to, to slow. Um, then again, let's say oil was at $150 a barrel right now. We'd be talking about how high oil prices are the cure for high oil prices <laughs> and that that was going to constrain economic growth because the inputs were, you know, yeah. the economic but, inputs were getting too expensive. So it is kind of interesting. It, that we yeah, have but people put way too much focus on oil prices. It doesn't have that. It, it's not as big of a driver that everybody gives it credence to. I mean, you know, if you're trading oil, that's great. Right. But, you know, again, oil, does, I'm not saying oil has no impact. But again, when you're talking about inflation as an example, oil energy oil oil makes up nothing of CPI. Oil prices has nothing to do with CPI. Seven percent of CPI, only seven percent of CPI is energy. That's utility costs. That is, you know, uh, heating oil costs. That's those type of things. They're the byproducts of oil prices. Obviously affected by oil prices directly. But again, you know. It's a very small component of inflation. Housing is over 30%. So, 
you know, you know, you've got to keep this stuff in the conflict. So there's a lot of people that want to focus on energy prices and going, oh, look at this. This is happening. This is the end of the world. Not so much. There's much more important indicators outside of that, outside of energy prices that are going to drive economic activity, like retail sales, which is 40% yeah. of PCE. It, let me just interject one thing here, just yeah. to get your reaction to it, which is um, you're correct in terms of the direct measurement of of energy input into the CPI calculation. Right. But oil is a input into everything, right? Sure. You talk about housing, right? Well, I mean, you need the oil to, you know, cut the lumber, ship it to the place. It's in everything that goes into the house. I mean, it, it, it so I just want to say, you know, I, I want to raise that question, which is it's, it's, it, it's not just limited to that small slice. It does have an impact on everything else. May, maybe less than we think. I don't know. I'll let you react to that, but that is one unique thing about oil is it pretty much is an import, import into almost everything in the economy. Right. And it's factored into everything else because it's factored into the price of your house. It's factored into the price of your car. It's factored into everything, right? Because it's an input cost. And this is why we take a look at producer price indexes. Um, you know, again, we look at CPI on the consumer side. This is what we're spending. We also look at PPI, which is what producers are spending. And so as oil, as the input of oil prices comes into the production process, that is passed on to consumers. And there is a point. And look, I, and I'm not saying there's, and again, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying. I'm not saying like energy has nothing to do with anything. It has, it has everything to do with everything. It's just not as a singular indicator, the best indicator to look at for a you know, major market crash or an economic recession. It certainly has an impact, but it's a much smaller impact than a lot of the fear mongers out there want to make it. Got it. This is, um, and this is why they're generally wrong. Right. Well, and we've talked, we spent actually a lot of time last week talking a lot about how if you invest via the headlines, it's kind of a recipe to lose your money <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> because the prevailing narrative generally always tends to be wrong here. Um, just because you mentioned it, the, the, you know, the, the importance of indicators. Um, there's one indicator that we hardly ever talk about anymore. We talked about it an awful lot when it first came on the scene, which was the inverted yield curve. Right. Right. I mean, it just, it's kind of like we just accept that we just live under an inverted yield curve these days because you now had it for so long. And I know you've said, hey, it's not the inversion that gets you, it's the uninversion. And so I guess until the uninversion happens, we just won't really spend that much time talking about it. But it is kind of amazing that we've had so many inverted yield curves for this long. And it's kind of like I live out here in California, right? And we all know theoretically that the big one could happen at any minute, right? But you just can't live with that hanging over your head. So the thing we talk the least about out here in terms of risks is earthquakes. We'll talk about fire risk. We'll talk about floods. We'll talk about a whole bunch of other things. But we've just kind of given up worrying about the big one because we just it's so out of our control and it's just been hanging around forever, right? And the inverted yield curve is now beginning to kind of feel like that. Well, this, and but see, this is another narrative. Uh, you know, when the, yield, the inverted yield curve happened, all you heard was people talking about, oh, a recession's coming, a recession's coming. And you and I were talking about things like, hey, it's right. not the reset, it's not the inversion, it's the uninversion that matters. And the longer that it's there, the less that people give credence. So oh, well, it's wrong this time. This time is different. And we're still inverted. We still haven't uninverted the yield curve. Uh, we're getting closer, um, but we haven't uninverted it yet. And that probably isn't going to happen until next year. And then we'll see, um, you know, kind of what happens from there. But I still wouldn't discount that the uninversion of the yield curve doesn't you know, relate to much slower economic activity at that point. Yeah, well, that's because why I'm bringing it up, which is it still has a great track record. So you talk yeah. about indicators that have a really good track record. The the inverted yield curve is one of them. Right. We've just been stuck on inversion for so long. <laughs> We've kind of just gotten used to it or forgotten about it. Well, again, you know, this is the problem with the markets, though, right? So we talk about valuations as a good example. This, and this is, you know, Cape valuations are, are a great example of market narrative. So once we hit 25 Sorry, can, can you define cape for folks that don't understand oh, sure. that it's it's the it's the it's the uh, dr robert schiller's version of smooth valuations he uses 10 years worth of earnings to create a valuation called the sickly adjusted pe ratio um and, and so it all is is it smooths out the year-to-year -year volatility of earnings changes that that's all it is but anyway um you know Whenever you know PEs hit 25 or 30 or whatever the number is, you'll see a whole bunch of articles coming out. It's like, oh, 
markets are overvalued. This means a decade of low returns you know, are coming up. And so if the markets don't immediately crash and go to zero, everybody goes, oh, well, see, it, it, you know, it didn't matter because you know valuations is different this time. It's not different. Valuations do matter. And look, we've already spent, you know, the, the last time that we had 30, 35 times earnings was about two years ago. And we've had two years with zero returns. So on a, on a total basis, right? right? So we still haven't set new highs, new all-time highs for the market. So we've been in this grind for two years, trading sideways. If next year's another kind of sideways years, there's three. Um, you know, so, you know, that's, that's what valuations mean. But if valuations as a narrative doesn't doesn't manifest itself into an immediate 40% downside in the market, then it's wrong. And this is why you've got to be really super careful about narratives and taking a look at like, this is this is grabbing headline attention right now because if it bleeds, it leads. We talked about that last week. You know, focus on what's happening underneath the surface. And this is why it's important to pay attention to the technicals of the market relative to these big macro views, because macro views are very hard to get right because things change over time and markets adapt and economies adapt. And you can point to this one particular thing and say, well, every time this has happened, you've had a depression. Um, markets and economies and, and, and governments and central banks, they're all adapting to this stuff to try to keep that stuff from happening again. So just be careful of these big macro narratives that says, you know, we're about to have this major 50% crash in the market because of the debt, because nobody wants to buy our debt, whatever it is, you know, and then the central bank comes up and starts buying everything on the, on the, under, the, under the sun. That's, that's going to completely shaft that narrative of whatever you thought it was going to be. Right. And, and I think oil is a great example of that where, um, Look, I'm on the train that says, look, over the arc of the rest of our lives, oil is going to become more expensive, mm -hmm. right? There's a there's a whole host of reasons that I can lay out here and have with previous guests uh, about why that's likely to happen. But if you just sort of shove all your money into, you know, expecting an oil price north of 150 bucks a barrel, you're likely going to get killed many, many times along the way because it's a highly volatile uh, commodity. And well, it's, just... it's, it's, it's a great that's a great point, because remember, in, in 2007, we had peak oil. Right. Mm -hmm. And your and your narrative was exactly the narrative back in 2007. So we're running out of oil. We can't produce any more oil. The population is growing all these reasons. And we're going to have that. We're going to have a, a, a you know for the rest of the next hundred years. It's going to be high oil prices above one hundred dollars a barrel. You better get used to it. And then we found this thing called fracking and oil prices went to 20 bucks a barrel. So. You know, and then again, just not that long ago, 2021, you know, we're running up in oil prices. Everybody's talking about $150, $200 barrel of oil. You better get used to it. And we have negative oil prices. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to, this is, you've got to be so careful about these, these, you know, demographic narratives or, or, or these big long term macro outlooks because things change. People invent new technologies. And, and the peak oil theory was probably right until they invented fracking. And that changed the game. Yeah, right? a couple of things. Right. Um, they didn't invent fracking in 2008. They just no, applied new technologies. Like, to, oh, I know, but you're going to get pushback in the comments, which is why. Well, I it, it the, the point is, is that <laughs> that's when fracking became a thing. It was a, yeah. it was a freaking miracle, and it saved the world as we know. It. Yeah, no, fracking had been around before that, but nobody was using it. Um, but again, this is this is you know, but this is the point, and we're going to invent new technologies. You know, we've got AI now, which, is, which has been around for a decade, but now people are starting to actually use it. And that's the thing is like we can invent these technologies. We may not; they may be on a shelf for a decade, and somebody's going to find the use for it that changes something. You know, the metaverse. You know, it was a really hot thing two years ago. Now nobody Google's it anymore. But at some point, somebody may figure out a reason how the metaverse is going to change something. And it'll become a thing right. and it's going to change the world as we know it. We probably will live in a ready player one society at some point, as Maybe. depressing as that sounds. But but the point I'm making, which is a little bit nuanced compared to what I think you're saying, but I think you agree with me, is let's say for a moment that that I'm right, that the peak cheap oil folks are right in the long run, right? Sure. And I guess you, um, I'm going to think maybe you might think the same thing. If you don't, let me know. But like you can have the correct long term view, but you've got to be very careful how you position yourself because like I said, you can just get slaughtered multiple times along the way there. Right. And that's, that's why I don't have long-term views. 
And, and long-term views are terrible for managing your money. Your view should be three months, maybe six months at the most. You can't survive five years. Uh, you know, it, it's great to think that you can invest in something and hold it for five years. You won't because as soon as it crashes on you, and it will for one reason or the other, you're going to sell it out at the bottom and then the market's going to rally back. And then you're going to be pissed off that the market rallied back without you because it's all a rigged game now. And then you're going to buy back in at the high and get slammed again. And then pretty much you'll quit investing after that and be, be done and move on. That's what happens to 80% of investors, right? So having a long-term, you know, when you listen to stuff about long-term macro views that are going to occur over 10 or 20 years, I don't care. Don't email emails from people like these long emails about stuff. And over the next 20 years, it's going to happen. It's like, I don't care. I'm managing money to make money right now. I may not be around in 20 years. I'm old. So, you know, <laughs> you know I've got to make money right now. And, and again, there's so, my point is, is so many things can happen. Um, you know, yeah, we're, you know, we're all dependent on oil today. I don't know. In 20 years, do we even need oil anymore? Do we all shift over to new? I'm not saying we are, right? I'm, Wait, I'm, it, I'm it, saying, it, but do we all shift over to nuclear and hydrogen? Or natural gas, whatever it is, I don't know, and I can't, I can't predict that far out. No, no, okay. and nobody else can either. All right, but this was a great segue because it's exactly where I was taking this. So there is a big bull market going on right now in uranium, right? That's right. And there are people out there who successfully said over the past several years, "Look, things are changing in the nuclear space. Right? Countries are beginning to realize that nuclear is just going to have to be part of the mix going forward." Um, uh, there's some dynamics that went around this, the supply situation in the uranium market, given Japan taking its nuclear fleet offline post Fukushima and then bringing it back online recently. So the glut that was there is now gone. And so it took longer, I think, than many of them expected, but it finally has kicked in, right? Yep. So how do you how do you match something like that where you are taking more of a strategic play in the portfolio of like, hey, I, I I do believe there's a big trend that will catch on at some point in time. And I want to have some exposure to that if it indeed does happen versus I just have my three month to six month, you know, kind of tunnel vision. Well, if, if you if, if you have this view of something that you think is going to play over long term, then, you know, buy a very, very small in, in investment in it. You know, it's, it's less than 1% of your portfolio and let it sit there. And if it goes to zero, no big deal. It's 1% of your portfolio. If it starts to work, you add to it. And then as it continues to work, you keep building the position. You know, so, you know, there's you just do it strategically. And, you know, and, and, and also too, by having a very small weight in it, if it does go to zero, you're not up all night figuring out why you lost all your money. Right. It's right. a very small weight in your portfolio and it's there. That's fine. Right. You can always play with some Vegas money. That's a great way to think about it is is also is like if I was going to go to Vegas and, and play blackjack, how much money would I take? Right. And don't lie. Don't lie to me and don't lie to yourself and say, oh, I'd take ten thousand dollars. If that if you think that's the case, get on a plane, fly to Vegas and see how much money you actually take with you and how much you actually bet at the table. That's how, see much, how much you take home. Yeah. 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 Well, no, not not that. It's just that you know, when when the money hits the table, right? That's when it gets real. Yeah. And it's easy to delude yourself and say, oh, well, I, if I was going to go to Vegas and gamble, I'm gonna bet ten thousand dollars. Okay, BS, first of all. But secondly, you know, even if you are, ten thousand dollars to you may be nothing, right? You may have fifty million dollars in the bank. So a ten thousand dollar bet is nominal, right? That may be nothing. So it's got to be relative to what you would be willing to lose. And you can bet that because that's all you're doing at this point is just betting on some future outcome that you have absolutely no control over. And that's the very basis of speculating. So you never bet more than you're willing to lose and you expect it to go to zero. All and right, then if so, it works out for you to make money, awesome. So so this is, this is actually a really relevant discussion for I think a lot of viewers here. Because um, I, I think from my understanding of having been in communication with these folks for several years, you know, there is a proclivity to um, prefer hard assets, um, you know, where for a whole bunch of reasons, um, people are saying, um, I, I think they are going to appreciate on a relative basis better than a lot of other assets going forward. And they've, they, they've been in a long downtrend and you hear the talk about a commodity super cycle and stuff like that. So again, I can make a really detailed case for why hard assets will probably relatively outperform over the next 10 years. What I'm hearing from you saying is, is hey, great, if that's your your point of view. Um, but 
don't just throw all your money into that and then cross your fingers and hope this thing you have no control over happens. It is make the position prove itself to you. So take a foundational point uh, position, one that you can sleep with, right? That if, if you're wrong, you're not going to be destitute. And then if and as the market starts performing the way that you, you think it will, you start adding into that, almost like adding kindling to like the initial spark of a fire. And then eventually you're adding logs, you know, once it really gets going. Right. And then know when to sell. That's the other side of it. Yeah. You know, I've, I've seen more people over time that they get the bet right and then never sell and they wind up losing it all. So, you know, it's it's just important to know when to buy as it is when to sell. Okay. But it, again, you know, it's, that's, that's going to be part of this discussion that we hope we get to in a bit because sure. there's some great words of wisdom on that. Yeah, but I mean, but that's how every great investor makes money over time and survives. And why 80, you know, explain to me why we've had three major bull markets since 1980. And 80% of people have less than $500 in bank. Yeah, part of it is the fact that they don't save and part invest. But even most investors haven't made a lot of money in the financial markets. And, and the reason is because they constantly do the wrong things. They bet on narratives. They don't manage their risk. They do everything, you know, backwards. They, they, you know, sell low and buy high because it's all the emotions and other things that go into it. And, and these narratives are great, but, you know, have, you know, have your narrative that somebody's yelling at you. And again, most people don't do the research. They just hear some guy on some channel on some TV says, oh, I think hard assets are going to be the thing to be in for the next, you know, 20 years. So you better go buy your stuff now. And by the way, I happen to sell this very commodity. So if you need to buy gold, give me a call because I'll sell it to you. You know, be careful of, of who's pitching you these narratives and do A, do they have skin in the game? But B, are they actually talking to, you know, is it in your best interest? Does it fit within your financial goals? Does it fit within your time frame? It's great to be right about a narrative, but if you died 10 years before it happened, it wasn't great. <laughs> right, right. You know, I mean, we we talk a lot and we're talking a lot today about the emotional um, pitfalls, you know, to being a successful investor. And, and the reason why is because they generally tend to be the, the biggest obstacles to success for a lot of investors. Um, but, you know, I really enjoy when I bring, um, when I get to talk to a behavioral economist, you know, someone like a Peter Atwater or a Dan Ariely who I've had on the program and, and I'm always trying to get more on. Um, I'm thinking, Lance, it might be fun for one of these weekly market recaps for me to bring one of those guys on. And just for us, and I'd love to sort of see you and them be in conversation because they tend to be more on sort of the academic side, right? They have all the studies, they have sort of all the, the rules and principles. And then you've got all like the, the practical experience, you know, the, 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 the what's happens on the street, you know, when, 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 when the trades are getting made, you see the people actually making the, the, the emotionally charged decisions. That would be a really interesting combination. I think is that something you'd be open for? Yeah, of course. All right. Well, folks watching, if you'd like to see that, let me know in the comment section below. And if uh, interest is high enough, then I'll work on, on trying to make that happen going forward. But I think that could be really interesting because we talk a lot about the charts. We talk a lot about you know the macro stuff. Um, to actually have a behavioral expert in here to be able to riff with you off of that, I think would be really useful for folks. That'd be fun. That, definitely. Okay. Um, all right. Look, um, I want to get to... An, oh, and what would be fun about that, and this is a nice segue to where I'm going next, is um, we just had Thoughtful Money's first debate. I, I don't like to use the term debate for what just went on, um, but we had Matt Pipenberg and Brent Johnson talking about the future of the dollar. Um, it wasn't like a bare knuckle brawl. Uh, they weren't at each other's throats. It really was like a co-exploration of the topic. And they, they, in fact, they agreed on much more than they disagreed on, but they did have some very important fundamental um, differences of perspective. And I think folks just really enjoyed watching two smart, intelligent people sort of dissect a topic respectfully and, and you know, ping ponging back and forth and building off of each other. Again, it wasn't the sort of tear down, you know, type of mudsling fest that you so, see so, in a lot of other debate channels. So, what, so it wasn't a presidential debate is what you're saying. It was definitely not a presidential debate. Um, yeah, no, it was it was much more genteel than that. And I'd love to do more of this sort of, you know, genteel exploration of topics in the future. Um, but they were talking about uh, the future of the dollar. That's just one other, I just want to get your thoughts on this. It doesn't have to be long, but that's another asset that pretty much has, it, it's kind of gone everywhere, but it's ending the year where it started yeah. here. 
Yeah, I'm no. Just wondering if you know, what, 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 as a capital manager, what if any import impart that has for you import? No, no, the dollar has a lot of impact in terms of you know not only you know economic outcomes, but as well as you know other impacts to financial conditions, etc. So it's a key component of financial conditions. So, you know, it's very important. But again, you know, we, we go back and people want to, this is another, so like energy, the dollar is another one of those hot topics. And, you know, again, it's not the, you know, you know the, the topics range from the dollar's dead, nobody wants the dollar to, you know, to, to the other side of the coin as well. But at the end of the day, um, the dollar is very important to imports and exports. And so we're going to maintain in some aspect a relative balance to other currencies in the world. So again, if, if our dollar gets too expensive or if our dollar gets too cheap, it has an impact on our economy. So we're going to adjust the value of that dollar relative to the Chinese yuan or to the Japanese yen, et cetera. And it's the same thing with China and same thing with Japan. They're going to do the same thing because 70% of transactions are handled in the US dollar. That's not going anywhere anytime soon, not in our lifetimes anyway. And so just understanding the impact and importance of the dollar relative to financial conditions will give you a better insight as to what the potential impact to the economic outcome is going to be. Okay. Um, do you have any particular sense, guesstimate, expectation, portfolio assumptions about what the dollar is going to do next year? Um, I would, I, at this point, I would argue that in somewhere between the beginning of 2024 and mid 2024, the dollar is going to get stronger. Um, that's going to be a function of, you know, a, the, the fed is going to have to tighten financial conditions, which when they start to do that, we're going to see some flight to safety uh, at that point, which is going to help boost the dollar a bit because money will flow into to the dollar, then into treasury. So yields will go down and ultimately uh, the dollar will get stronger. But again, there's a lot of variability to that. And so trying to make a prediction six months out is kind of futile. But my my guess is from where we are right now, given the amount of the sell-off we've had in the dollar, that the next trend of the dollar, at least in the, in the next six months, is probably going to either be sideways or, or higher. Okay. Um, I'm going to trundle over into your view on treasuries, your latest update of view on treasuries in a second. Um, because we're talking about currency, um, there is another bull market going on right now, and it's one that we don't talk about all that much. Um, but I just want to get any thoughts that you may have on it, which is Bitcoin. Yep. Yep. Bitcoin's now back up at 37,000. Um, so it is more than doubled, I think, from the lows. Um, all of a sudden, all the Bitcoiners and, you know, uh, digital currency folks are, you know, back out there, uh, uh, crowing and Hey, to a certain extent, you doubled your money in a short period of time. Good on you. If what I find really interesting, lows. pardon me? If you bought the lows. If you bought the lows, yeah. Um, and one of the things I find really interesting is um, there have been some really big scandals in the crypto space this year, right? We had FTX with Sam Altman, and, and that was somewhat coincident with the lows. But then just this past week, we had um, the, uh, the largest crypto exchange, Binance, just hit by the SEC with, I don't know, can't remember how many billions in uh, in fees for, I, I don't even know exactly what it was, I think money laundering and a few other violations and stuff like that. Um, so there, there clearly is a lot of cleanup that still needs to happen in this industry, but that didn't dent the price of cryptos at all when that news came out this week. And, and who knows, no. maybe it's being taken as a good sign that things are getting cleaned up or whatever, but. No, not at all. It's basically Bitcoin is a risk asset and you've had a massive flow into risk assets and Bitcoin has responded in kind. So, um, you know, when the market sell, there's a very high correlation between Bitcoin and the financial markets because it's a risk asset. And, you know, as such, when people are taking on a lot of risk, they buy Bitcoin for the risk. And so you've had a very nice run in it. I've owned Bitcoin now. I can't remember when I made my first purchase, but basically over the last three years, four years, however long it's been, last time that Bitcoin was at 37,000. I've made no money. So, on um, you know, you got you go back and again we talk about these bear markets that occur over time. Bear markets aren't the fact that something goes down constantly over time, it's the fact that over time you make no money. So if you look back over the last few years, you've made no money with Bitcoin as an example. That's a bear market, right? 
yeah, you've had this terrific rally off the lows, but now Bitcoin's got to go to you know eighty thousand to start being in a technically a kind of a new bull market. So you know, again, this is just you know kind of one of those other things. Yeah, Bitcoin's doing great. You've had a great you know rally. I'm glad finally because I'm almost back to break even on, my, on some of my positions. Um, and maybe in another ten years, I'll actually make some money on it. I don't know. Um, we'll we'll see. But you know, there was an experiment that I when I bought it way back when it was an experiment. I'm still holding it. We'll see how it works out. Yeah, experiment personal or do you actually hold any for clients? Oh no, absolutely not. This is not okay. an asset you would ever put in a client account. Um, no, I just it's a, a personal, yeah, experiment. I, you know, because I, I wanted to learn more about it, how it worked, how it responds to markets. Um, how it responds to economic data, responds to all these type of things. And look, we've been saying for years that, you know, I think you and I had this discussion that at some point the SEC is going to regulate, you know, cryptocurrencies. It's happening. And the function is, is who's going to actually survive the regulations will be the next big kind of winner. So, you know, I think you've got to either be in Bitcoin or Ethereum. Those are only two right now that, you know, I can see surviving the regulatory environment. Maybe there's some others. But, you know, we're starting to see, you know, what's happening now is these regulations get put into place. We're starting to see all the roaches in the kitchen. All right. Uh, so just interesting because you, you brought it up. So um, you've held it now for a couple of years. Um, has your opinion on its prospects changed in any material way uh, over that period of time? No, because there's still not a there's still not a viable use for it. Um you know, that's the that's the thing. You know, everybody keeps saying that, oh, Bitcoin's going to be a replacement for the currency. It's not. Um, it's going to take the place of the dollar. It's not. Um, you know, it's going to take over all these transactions. It hasn't. So, yeah, you can, you know, at, at, at some point you can maybe transact Bitcoin for, you know, an NFT or whatever it is. That's fine. But, you know, companies that went out and said, hey, I'll take Bitcoin for my product. They quit because the value of the uh, drop is too volatile. So at some point, if Bitcoin is going to be anything other than just basically a risk asset, because that's all it is right now, it's just people buy it, hopefully to make some money. Um, it's got to have some type of valid use. And, and we'll have to see if, the, and that's why I'm, I'm still holding it, because again, you know, I'm, I'm going to hold the, it's a, it's a, let me be clear. It's a very small percentage of my portfolio. If it goes to zero, it's my Vegas money. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, but, you know, at some point, it's going to have to find its place if it's going to be a valid instrument to where we can, you know, use it for transactions and I don't have to convert it back to the dollar in order to use it. So, you know, we've got to get there and, and maybe there's something on the rising kind of like the metaverse with, you know, with meta. Maybe at some point the metaverse will be, you know, have a really strong valid use and it'll be a dominant, you know, thing. Uh, I have no idea. And again, I can't predict that far in the future, so I don't even try. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, I'm sure we're going to get a ton of uh, feedback from uh, whatever Bitcoin and crypto folks are watching this right now. But we're yeah, used to and, it. And, and just go for it because, again, I, I don't have, you know, I don't have any real, you know, dog in the in the, in the hunt. So again, I'm just trying to make money for my clients and myself personally. And so that's, again, these are all great topics, but again, nobody knows. And if anybody knew with certainty, there would be just, you know, if, if, if people could know with certainty the future, then everybody would be wealthy. We wouldn't have 80% of the population living paycheck to paycheck, <laughs> right? So nobody knows. And I think it's a complete waste of your viewer's time and a complete waste of your time to spend your time focusing on these big long-term macro views that have nothing to do with the price of sliced bread today. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm going to talk about views that are going to maybe impact us next year, not necessarily tomorrow. Um, but this is back to where um, bonds and yields are likely to go. Um, you and your partner, Michael Leibowitz, um, I, I believe are still very much on the train that uh, very good time to be buying bonds. Um, you're increasing the duration that you're you're going out on. I'm primarily talking about treasury bonds here. Um, I just want okay, you to react to Just, just real quick, while you were doing that, I went and looked up. My first purchase of Bitcoin was in December of 2018. So, All right. So you've been hodling yes. since then. I've been hodling since 2018. Yes. <laughs> okay. I so you got a little bit of time, time, you fly, time flies. I didn't realize it had been that long. It had been that long, yeah. Uh, six years, practically, right? No, getting close to that. Um, so, um, all right. Well, look, um, 
So I had Jesse Felder on the program recently, um, and he raised a, the concern that we could go into recession next year, and that could actually send interest rates and bond yields higher. Okay. And his logic there is, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, was that um, you know right now there's a supply demand imbalance as he sees it uh, in the treasury market where supply has really grown, demand has been weaker. Um, if we go into recession, that will crater tax receipts, um, making the uh, the issues we have with the current deficit even more stark, more visible. And that um, bondholders, and, and, that, and that gets made worse if inflation remains sticky through this point in time. His, his, his argument doesn't depend on that, but it gets exacerbated if inflation remains sticky. And he basically says, under those conditions, you know, the, the bond uh, buyers are going to demand higher yields um, because of that. And I'm just curious what you think. Um, there's no historical evidence to support that thesis. Okay. Period. <laughs> Period. Uh, <laughs> move on. And, um, no, I mean, if you have a recession, yields go down with recession because yields are a function of inflation, economic growth, and and ultimately wages. So that's where that's what drives yields. Again, what drives yields? It's it's whether or not I can loan money at a certain price over time. And you know, bond buyers um, who are buying those bonds are the ones looking out saying, okay, if I buy the bond today, then what's my rate of return going to be at this certain date in the future? And that's what's basing it on yields. And of course, at that point, if you have a recession, if you have an economic slowdown, if you have um, any type of impact to the financial markets, guess who's going to be your number one bond buyer? Right? Well, that'll be the Fed if the Fed actually steps back in at that point in time, right? And, and they will, um, because that is their tools. So they've already, the Jerome Powell has been very clear. He's not worried about a recession. Why is he not worried about a recession? To his quote. Because he knows how to fix it. Yeah. But no, his quote, we have the tools to deal with that. Right. So in other words, that's cut interest rates to zero. And if they cut interest rates to zero, the long end will follow. Inflation will fall, uh, inflation will fall because you have a recession, less economic demand, and that's going to lead to lower yields. So there is no, there is no scenario where you can have spiking yields in a recession, that never occurs. Let me ask you this. Might that occur for a while this time before Powell goes into rescue mode, right? Might he, might, 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 might he let the pain prolong for longer than normal? Because because we, we've had the Fed on a hair trigger for so many years. We finally don't, right? Right, because as soon as we had a bank crisis back in March, they immediately started the bank term funding program. Yeah, but that wasn't a recession. That was a threat to the integrity of the banking system. What do you think a recession is? A natural part of the business cycle, it should be. When was the last time, when was the last time we had a natural part of the business cycle? Well, we haven't because the Fed's been on a hair trigger. There you go. Do you, why do you think that's going to change? Uh, if you have a recession, right? That well, is for the a, reasons you're saying, we're Powell saying, I know how to deal with that. So I want to get right, inflation threat, down lower, right? A, a recession is a threat to financial stability. They are going to support that financial stability. That's just, right, so the just for the purposes of debate here, totally agree, but but so okay. is inflation, right? And so he's trying to get inflation subdued. And so that might let him, let the system take more pain as long as it's run of the mill recession pain, right? If, if, if the banking system's in jeopardy, okay, different story, right? Sure. So yeah, let's say inflation runs along and say, you know, it can't run along at three and a half percent, right? It's got to run to two. Which he's already he's already noticed he's already stated in his last meeting that you know basically bond yields and 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 the stock market at that point was doing the work for the Fed of tightening monetary conditions. Yep. Now, now this is this is one thesis that we're ta that we've been talking a lot about over the last couple of weeks is that the stock market and the bond market are kind of screwing themselves at this point because the drop in yields and the run up in stock prices are loosening financial conditions. So I expect at the December meeting that the Federal Reserve is not going to make a statement of any type that they are done hiking rates. They are going to leave that one more rate hike out on the table because they need to tighten up financial conditions. So I would expect in the near term to see interest rates go back up, bond, yield, bond prices come down. Uh, that's why we recently took a little bit of profit off, of, off our trading position in our bond portfolio because bonds have gotten a bit ahead of themselves. They're overbought just like the stock market. So expect a reversal. But again, 
it, when you start talking about the bigger macro picture, if you get into a recession, the Fed will cut rates. And if there is any type of real lack of demand, which there is not uh, for, for bonds, um, you know, foreign buyers have been buying, you know, at the same pace they were basically back in 2000. You know, if there's any real lack of demand, then the Federal Reserve will step in and buy the excess. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to just sort of re-go, remake this point because I think it's potential, which is that um, in until and unless inflation is at two or close enough to two, where the Fed can say, all right, I, I did, you know, what I've been working on for the past couple of years, I did, right? I think they will pivot if we get into a recession, but I think they are going to wait for the world to come to them on bended knee to yeah. say, Fed, please pivot. Right. Well, I, I know inflation's still at three or two, nine or whatever, but we need you to do this. And Sounds like you get a different opinion. No, no, they just they won't wait that long. I mean, it won't be the world coming. Because, again, if the world's coming to them on bended knee, you're in a financial crisis. Right. Well, but the world's already coming to them on bended knee. You're getting them. They're getting letters from the you know mortgage lenders and the NAR. And please, you know, like it's already starting. <laughs> I know. And so uh, I guess if you're what, what you mean by bended knee, right, if you're talking about the financial system under massive strain and they're going to wait for that, they're not going to wait that long. Um, no, but I think they're going to wait for the political yeah. air cover. Right. I mean, it might be Biden coming and saying, you know, I'm demanding that the Fed, you know, reverse course or whatever. Right. That, that um, just what Trump did in 2018. Yeah. Right. Because Trump was, you know, we should fire Jerome Powell. He's screwing everything up. We were down 20% in the market then. But but again, the, and the he big, did pivot. He, he did eventually he, pivot. And he pivoted. Um, and there was no crisis, right? There was no recession and he pivoted, right? And of course, we didn't realize at the time that the hedge fund economy was blowing up. But, you know, that's, but there was no technical recession. Um, and he's cut race to zero in, in June of 2019. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be this environment, but the, the bottom line though is is that if the, if if the economy is slowing into recession, you can't have inflation. Why? Because inflation is supply and demand in the economy. So if you have a recession, that slower economic growth, that means you have less demand. Inflation comes down. That's just a function of, of how it works. So you know right. you can't. And if inflation comes down, yields come down because yields track inflation. They don't they don't stay detached from each other. Yeah. And this is where I think 2024 is going to be a really interesting year. I just think that there's a lot that can happen this year. And we've got enough uh, disagreement. It's funny, like 2022, nobody could really, they were all watching in sort of disbelief. Like nobody thought the market could just keep grinding down like that. 2023, everybody was convinced we we're going to have a recession. Market shocked everybody, right? 2024, I, I feel like everybody, I feel like there's much more disagreement about what could happen here. Um, but just to note one prediction, uh, David Rosenberg said that we'll have a one handle on inflation uh, on the CPI by uh, by the end of 2024. Uh, that'll be really interesting to see. I can definitely see the potential for that happening. I think maybe you can too. Um, but if it does, it's going to make a real interesting year. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I have no idea what next year is going to be. I mean, you know, there's no guarantee we'll have a recession next year. There's no guarantee we'll have a recession, period. Um, there's some things that are going on. So let me let me put it this way. So yields have come down. Already mortgage applications are increasing, right? Um, home prices are ticking up. Consumer confidence will improve because of lower interest rates. Um, the stock market going up increases consumer confidence. So they go out and spend more money. So that postpones having a recession because you now have this impetus of lower yields impacting the consumer which is now going out to spend more money. That's inflationary, by the way. So now you have this uptick in inflation. Yields go back up. That gets the Fed on the, you know, back on the problem of, of monetary policy being too tight. So they start trying to talk down the market again, which then drives the yields, you know, yields down and the stock market down, which then impacts consumer confidence, which then begins to weigh on the economy. You see the problem? Mm -hmm. Right. And this is going to be 2024. Nobody has any freaking clue what's going to happen. Neither do I. That's why we just have to navigate it for what it is. Exactly. And and so just on the topic of recession, you know, we we talk a lot about the potential here. Um, I believe it's still your base case, despite you not knowing. I don't want to put words in your mouth to so change that. Yeah, I will say it's my base case. Um, <laughs> there, there's just um, one, uh, one sort of recession watch data point I want to put up here. Uh, I've had John Rubino on this program. I've known John for many, many, many years. And one of his sort of recessionary indicators that he has 
looked at for years. I mean, since the the 08 recession, um, is RV sales. Um, right. So he looked, you know, it's it, it's the ultimate toy that you don't need, right? And everybody buys it when times are flush, and then it's one of the first things to go, right? When times are bad, and um, uh, we're finally actually seeing some some real deterioration in that market. And let me see if I can share my screen here real fast. Uh, the pandemic motorhome bubble bursts with RV sales down 49% year to date. Um, so we're definitely seeing some some real crazy, you know, the, the froth is coming off the sales. Uh, and of course, during the pandemic era, everybody wanted an RV. And then when the um, when the stimulus checks were going out, you know, people were using them to buy RVs and RV prices went to the moon. Um, and then revenge travel happened. And that was a mechanism by people who were doing revenge travel. Um, here's a tweet that that just came out, um, which basically says, uh, uh, hey, remember that expensive trendy thing that everybody was buying? When that starts showing up on Facebook Marketplace everywhere, like that's the beginning that the the top is probably in, right? And people are starting to see stress. And he does, he does make this great comment down here. It says, I received a call about two years ago from a custom van build-out contractor looking for a new line of work. He said his business had gone flat. That was a lead uh, indicator to confirm we were at a housing top. Then um, he's got this great point. When 25% of the vehicles headed towards the mountain are $100,000 or more custom vans, it's probably time to sell, <laughs> right? So we do seem to be maybe seeing one sort of classic uh, recessionary indicator here is that the, the the fun, the money on fun is beginning to dry up. Right. And, and but the, see, that's the, that's the big driver for all of this, right? So- you know, people talk about, you know, the Federal Reserve. And so, so if the Federal Reserve starts buying bonds, that's inflationary, right? And that's not inflationary because it's an asset swap. You know, the, the difference is that we sent checks to households and we gave people money. And, and remember back then, too, in 2020, it was all about the fire movement, you know, which was the financial independence, retire early. And so everybody was going to save up three hundred thousand dollars. They're going to throw it all into the market, and make eight percent of their money every year, go live in a van down by the river, and that was going to be the new life. Uh, interesting article out last week is now millennials are going to what's called soft saving. Uh, in other words, they're not saving at all for retirement. It's all about you know living life now because you know life sucks. You might as well enjoy it you know while it's here because it's just not going to ever get better. So now they're doing. They've gone. They've gone from fire to you know, smoke. Right so now we're not gonna. We're not gonna <laughs> save anything. Um, but you know that's all. That's that's all a function of when you inject too much capital into an economy. You give people that are typically non-responsible capital to spend. They go out and they make stupid purchases. And so it's interesting that you know it's like retail RV sales down forty nine percent. Well, you gotta kind of put that into perspective. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but. If I sold, if I normally sell five RVs a year, I'm just picking numbers, and then pandemic checks go out, so I sell 10, right? And then I just go back to normal, which is five, I'm down 50% in my sales, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, you, the, you know, these headlines are great, but again, I haven't looked at the RV sales, right? But I need to strip out that anomaly of RV sales to understand what the trend of RV sales is in a normal economic environment. And is that, indicating a recession or not, right? You mentioned tax receipts earlier. Tax receipts are down large last year. Normally that means a recession, but we're not in a recession. So what, what's going on? Why am I getting this big drop in tax receipts? So the, those, are the, those are the things that we need to know because we created so many anomalies from 2020 to 2022 that are now coming out of the system as that pig in the python works its way through. We've got to start fleshing some of this out to see what normal actually looks like. They've distorted the comparisons. Yeah. J just to be clear on the recession, like, hey, why are we not in one? You know, David Rosenberg, he would say, well, we might be in one. And the reason why he says that is because he says GDI, he thinks, is a much more accurate teller of the tale than GDP, given how GDP is calculated. And GDI is much more closer to recession than than GDP is. Yeah, but then, but I, I don't disagree with David on that point. He's right. But there was this big gap between GDP and GDI. And everybody said, well, when we get the revisions, that GDP number is going to collapse towards GDI. And we're going to be in a recession. Well, when we got the revision, GDI was raised up towards up. GDP. So, you know, again, you got to, this, this is my point. You got to be so careful with this data because, again, the revisions will kill you. Yeah. Hey, what one point talking about the the stimulus, uh, the different types of stimulus. Another thing David talked about was um, 
one of the things that pushed out the arrival of the recession, you know, he, he, he thinks a recession should have happened a while ago and it just keeps getting pushed out. You know, one, because the, the pig was in the Python was way bigger than we all could have fathomed. Um, but he also said that uh, the, the savings rate has dropped so low. This is not just the youngest generations doing soft everybody. saving. I mean, it's kind of everybody, right? And he said that that has basically acted as a stimulus to the economy where we just decided to save less, right? We've ratcheted that savings rate down. So stuff is still going into the economy that otherwise wouldn't be in a normal year. You combine that with the increase that we're seeing in revolving credit where people are, you know, people don't like to have to change until the pain, they don't change until the pain of not changing outweighs the pay of, pain of change, right? Sure. So they keep the lifestyle going and to make that happen, they start decreasing their savings, right? And then they start putting it on the plastic, right? And you can do that for a period of time, but not forever, right? Hey, no, you and I have talked about this before. You take a look yeah. at things like disability claims. Um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we have a financial crisis and everybody goes on to disability. Um, so, you know, we have, and you know, they go take out student loans, even though they're not even going to college and, you know, all these types of things. So, you know, what we know about the consumer, and David's absolutely right about this, is that they are very creative in coming up with ways to spend money. They don't, to your point, you know, I don't want to change my lifestyle, not until the, until the pain becomes too great, because they'll even suffer through the pain. They just will suffer through until it's no longer possible to maintain that lifestyle. And then they'll start doing something different. But, you know, it's when the, when you reach the point that the credit gets shut off and there is no more access to more money, then they'll have to start making changes. But until they get to that point, it's amazing how far consumers will dig themselves into a hole to maintain a lifestyle they really can't afford. Can't afford. You know, it's so interesting. There's There's so many of the macro trends that we look at that really at the end of the day, just they reduce to an exercise of how long can a can be kicked, right? <laughs> There's so much a lot policy wise that goes, it is way longer than you think. Uh, and it's policy wise, it's you know at the consumer household level. I mean, there are these limits and we hit them you know at various times in history. I and mean, we've seen it what happens when you hit them and it's not pretty, but it is amazing how extend and pretend can go on way long. And, and part of that, and this is what I, I tend to warn people about who are so certain that everything's going to fall apart tomorrow, is that the people who take that position, and I'm wired to want to take that position, you're up against the entire system. Everybody, yeah. corporate America, the government, the households themselves, they want the status quo to continue. So they will do an, an infinite number of unnatural acts to try to keep the status quo from going, right? Um, which is why, you know, it's so it's so rough to be a short seller and why you and I generally don't recommend that people sell short is because you got to get your timing right to make money there. And you can, again, be totally right on this. Hey, these this there will come a period of time where that can won't be kicked, won't be able to be kicked. But if you're positioning for that, and you really got to get the timing right or else you can just get steamrolled by the system just doing everything it can like a drowning man. It'll just grab anything to just keep going for another cycle. No, it's true. And this is why, you know, it, you're so much better off to be optimistic than pessimistic. Um, first of all, you'll be happier in life um, in general. You'll be more successful in life being optimistic rather than pessimistic. But um, if you're optimistic, 80 percent of the time, the market's going to be up. So, you know, your, your odds of winning on being optimistic are much greater than winning on being pessimistic. Understand the pessimistic side, right? I mean, look, you know, you don't cross, you're, you're optimistic that when you walk up to a road, you're going to cross it, that you're going to make it to the other side, but you still look both ways, right? Because that's the pessimistic, hey, I might get hit by a car, so I'm going to check to see if a car is coming before I cross the street. But you're optimistic you're going to make it across the street. So in your portfolio, always be optimistic. Always look forward with an optimistic view. Always invest with an optimistic view. But just be aware that there are those things that could come along, possibly, that might take away some of your capital. So, you know, it's so when you see the car coming, you wait to cross the street, right? So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll win much more often than you lose with an optimistic view versus a pessimistic. Yeah, and I think history proves that out. The math proves it out. Um, I'm a big fan of hedging. 
again, you'll just be a happier person too. You'll be a happy, but also I'm a fan of hedging because it lets you, it, it, it's insurance, right? It, it lets you basically say, look, if I'm, if I'm going to be a little reluctantly optimistic, you know, I can sleep at night knowing that my hedges will hopefully kick in. Right. And of course, all the stuff you talk about with position sizing and the gardening and all that stuff, you, you, you set yourself up so that, you know, not, not, there's not just one nuclear event that can destroy you. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, I had a really good rant that I wanted us to get to. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to get to it for time purposes, given the other stuff I still want to get through because we didn't get through this one last time. Um, this being again, your, your article that basically sort of summarizes the wisdom of the current, um, you know, investing elders that we have right now. Most of these guys are all still alive. Um, but I do want to go through a few of these with you. And I don't know how much you, you remember this from just the top of your head here, Lance. But there are a couple of great, great points here I want to walk through. And this is, again, um, maybe I'll start with the most important lesson here, which was, I think it was from Benjamin Graham. Yeah. Um, here's a quote from his classic book, The Intelligent Investor. The investor's chief problem and even his worst enemy is likely to be himself. And again, this comes back to really emotional decision making. It's not, oh, you're, you're your worst enemy because you're doing your math wrong, right? Um, it, it it really comes to just making the wrong choice at the wrong time because those old emotions of feed or greer, sorry, uh, fear or greed uh, are clouding your thinking. That's right. Um, you know, again, it's just everything we've talked about today. And, and look, I, I'm not, you know, let me be clear is that I'm not, you know, saying that bad things can't happen. They can. And my point is, is though, is that you can't focus on those because the market's going to, the market's going to go up more often than it goes down. And so you've got to be in a position to, to be with the market and as we said, you know, why do investors constantly, you know, not make money in markets? Because they sell low and they buy high. And again, that's exactly what Ben Graham's talking about. The worst, the worst problem that investors have are themselves. It's all the emotional mistakes they make. It's all the bad decisions they make. It's all the timing decisions they make. It's getting wrapped up in these big macro narratives that you can't and really invest for and hold long enough to actually for them to work out. So, you know, focus on what you can control. And that's the very short term, you know, position of the portfolio. Well, and you know, for most of these two, Lance, um, and by the way, I'll, I'll let you give the promo, um, but folks can find this, this article on your website. Most of these sort of axioms from these folks are some variation of humans do a bad job of assessing risk. Right. Right. And we, we end up, we end up paying for something that is way riskier than we realize, right? Um, or we, we, we buy something that goes up and we assume that we're brilliant. Uh, and then we, we ride that thing for way too long, like you said. I mean, there's a, in a, pre, a fast appreciating asset is in fact getting riskier <laughs> as it appreciates because it's getting overbought or whatnot, right? And so, um, you know, we tend to just oftentimes uh, make the wrong decision again not necessarily because of greed or fear but we just don't understand the risk level threat that we're currently operating under well that's right and you know but but that's you know this is the importance of the uh, of the article itself which is this difference between investing and speculation and the real overriding you know part of this article is that you are not an investor i'm not an investor adam's not an investor all the people that Adams interviews are not investors. You're not an investor as an individual. You're all we're all speculators. Why? Because as people putting money into the market, we're all just betting on some outcome in the future. We have no control over it. Um, Warren Buffett is an investor because when he invests into a company, he has control of what that company does. He can call the board of directors and say, "Hey, I don't like you doing that." So they don't do it. They go in some other direction. Um, he has that control. That's investing. And his time horizon is 100 years. So that's an investment where you control the outcome. But as us, we're just buying and selling ethereal, ethereal pieces of paper that trade into a marketplace. And we're just hoping that we're buying at one price and that someday we'll sell it at a higher price. 
that's the purest form of speculation. It's the same as sitting down with a hand of poker and hoping you're going to win. And you, you place your money out on the table. You hope your hand is better and you're a better player than everybody else at the table. And you can win more money than you bet. That's all you're doing in the financial markets. And all these rules, and maybe you can just put a link to the article you know, in this video, Adam, is just going through and talking. And every one of these, whether it's Jeff Gunlack, you know, the, the trick is to take risk and be paid for taking those risks. But, you know, take a basket of risk in your portfolio on a, on a diversified basis. Ray Dalio, the largest mistake that people make is to believe what happens in the past will happen in the future. Seth Klarman, most investors are primarily oriented towards return and not the risk that they take. So and, and every one of these, um, you know, whether it's Jeremy Grantham, Jesse Livermore, et cetera, you, they're all, you know, this tenant of every great investor over time is to focus on the risk because the risk is not how much money you make, it's how much money you lose when you're wrong. Well, and this is one of the reasons why um, I'm such a big proponent of people, the average person working with a, a good professional financial advisor, mm -hmm. because humans are bad at, at, at risk assessment, or at least they're, they're bad at this type of risk assessment, right? We've talked about this a lot, right? We're really well wired for the visible immediate threat, right? Is, is the tiger snarling and about to pounce on me? Okay, great. Do I flee or do I fight it, right? We're really good for that type of risk. For much more ethereal, esoteric stuff like this, we're very, very bad at it. And so having somebody who is skilled in risk management and who can create the structure uh, to work with you, not only to do all the goal setting and stuff that we talked about last time, Lance, but just to say, we are going to mathematically construct a portfolio here for you and then garden it, to use your words, in a way that we will be bringing the overall risk threshold down for you is is tremendously helpful versus the average person who sees the headline, you know, whatever gets emotionally invested uh, or charged up by something that's going on and is making mostly a gut speculative decision like you were talking about, right? With, with, without that discipline of risk assessment, which most people just haven't been trained to do, you really are speculating, you know, in the dark for if we're being honest with ourselves. No, and, and and that's why we have to control what we don't know. And, and you know, it's that old saying about, you know, it's, it's not what we know that, that is important. It's what we don't know that we don't know. And Well, well or, or or what Train would say, which I think is just as, as bad, is what we know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> exactly. I know this is, this is what's going to happen next month, right? Yeah. Exactly. And then you make your bet on it, and then that doesn't happen. And, you know, now you're really on the wrong side of the coin. Again, you know, this is just like October. In October, again, I was writing things like, like hey, this market's really oversold. We're going to bounce at some point here. And I was going to just tell you, like, no, this market's just going to go down. You're, you're completely missing it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and, and now it's bounced. And so if you were short the market going into the end of October, you're paying a price for it now. And that's just simply a function of making these bets on a certainty of outcome that we are not certain about at all. And you know, we this is why we have to always remember that we're speculating. And as spec and as speculators, what we have to do is manage our our bets. And you know, if you're playing, you know, a hand with a pair of twos, you're not going to bet all in. If you've got a full house, maybe you do go all in on your hand. But that's because you know that your odds of winning, you know, mentally. Or higher. I mean, even if you're a poor poker player, right, and you really don't understand all the odds of poker, you probably get the idea that if you have a pair of twos, you're probably not going to win the hand. So you're probably not going to bet a whole lot on that pot, right? But if you're holding four aces, you inherently know that's a pretty good hand. I mean, even a, a basic player gets that idea, and you're probably going to be willing to bet a little bit more on that hand. Even though you may lose, um, you're probably going to bet some more just because you know you've got a really good hand, but you don't approach it the same way when you invest. You do exactly the opposite by making big bets on very poor hands. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, just wrapping up on this, um, you know, it, it, there's two main things I take from, from these quotes. One is the risk assessment part. And then the other is the, the um, issues of, of emotion being in the driver's seat. And you mentioned this earlier, but I think it's, it's important to emphasize here. Um, Howard Marks here says, I think I got two quotes from him I want to talk to. Um, to. To buy low, one must sell high, right? <laughs> <laughs> Buying low doesn't help you if you end up riding it up and then back to a lower price than you bought it at, right? So it's it's really knowing when to sell or knowing when to take 
chips off the table. And I think that you, know, you said this earlier, that in many ways is when investment and investors sort of overconfidence begins to kick in. Oh, I've got this winner. I'm sitting on these great gains. I don't want to sell my winner. And of course, you 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 hear the story, ride your winners, right? Yeah. That's sort of one of the prevailing things here, right? And so talk for a second about that, because um, there is some logic there, right? If something's doing really well, yes, you want to lock in your gain to actually have the gain um, eventually. Um, but you there's an understandable sense of like, well, if, if, the, if this thing's really running, you know, I don't want to hop off secretariat if he's only at the halfway th around the track yet. Right. So how, how do you help somebody begin to get out of a position well, uh, that's done well? Well, no, you, you don't see, but that's, that's the misnomer. It's, it's that you don't have to get out of the position. Look, we've owned Apple forever. Right. Um, but we regularly buy and sell Apple. Uh, not entirely. Right. So, you know, and this is portfolio risk management 101, right? So, if I'm going to buy a position, every position in our portfolio can have up to a maximum weighting of 5%. A lot of our positions are less than 5% because of risk in the markets. We don't like the risk in the markets. We don't like the overvaluation in certain indi in indices, uh, certain certain stocks, valuations are too high. Um, and, and, but, you know, so when we say, okay, we want Apple to be 4% of the portfolio or whatever it is, when it gets to be four and a half or five, it's had a big run then we trim it back down to the portfolio weight, or maybe we'll reduce it even further. Maybe we'll make it 3% of the portfolio. And then when it eventually has a correction, which it always does, we then take it back up to portfolio weight. And you just do that back and forth over time. When things get really overbought and extended, you take some profits. You know, you never went broke taking a profit. It gives you cash. And just because you sell something today, take profits, doesn't mean you have to invest it immediately, right? right. Put cash. Let it sit there until you find another opportunity. This is the fascinating thing about the stock market, by the way, that I, it's, that's always boggled me uh, when I talk to individuals. And, and, and that is that they feel like they have to be all invested all the time. I've always got my cash in doing something. So if I sell something, I'm going to buy something else immediately. But, you know, if you were going to buy anything else, you know, like you're going to buy a new television or you're going to buy a new car. You do hours of research. You go online, you compare models, you compare makes, you look at the prices, which dealer has a better price, which one's giving more incentives, all this other stuff to try to save, you know, a nickel or a dime here or there. And, you know, my wife's the best at this. She'll drive all the way across Houston for an hour and a half to save 25 cents on something. You know, <laughs> you know she doesn't, you know, but that's girl math. Um, you know, she saved money. Um you know, but, you know, when it comes to the stock market, you don't apply that same type of frugality and you just, you know, because people have told you to do this is that you just buy whatever's going up. But just because you own something that's working doesn't mean you can't sell some of it and it doesn't mean you can't sell all of it. Then this has always been another fascinating thing about individuals. They, they think if they sell something, they're now in this club that is excluded from ever buying that asset again. Well, I sold Apple and I can't buy it back. That's not true. You can buy it and you can sell it and you can buy it right back. If, if you sell it at a wash, you got to wait 30 days for the wash sell rule. Then you can buy it back. That's tax loss selling, by the way. So, you know, there's there's nothing that, that uh, there's no requirement to take profits. That means you have to sell everything. We rarely sell everything unless we're doing tax loss selling or we just don't like the position. And more generally, we're taking profits here. We're buying it back cheaper later. Um, you know, those type of things. And so, you know, we have a lot of positions in our portfolio, Costco, Abby, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, we've owned them for a very long time. We're never going to sell them unless something changes within the market that says those are no longer good trending assets to own over the long term. And so far that hasn't happened doesn't mean that won't happen. And maybe at some point, you know, Apple's last earnings report was a good example of this. They're not growing revenue. And there may be a case to be made in the next year or two if they can't figure out how to grow revenue that maybe we sell Apple entirely because they can't grow revenues anymore, uh, as opposed to Google, which is still growing at double digits in some areas. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that, you know, you want to think about. But this idea of, you know, having to own something all the time is not true. Um, that if you sell it, you can't buy it back is not true. And you can't sell some, you have to sell all is also not true. So just focus on, you know, the position sizing and focus on the risk you're taking with that position and then manage it accordingly. It's, it's, it's not difficult. All right. Well, well said. And I'll just say for the average person watching who 
has a real life and a busy job and all that stuff. Um, yes, do that. But in, it, you may be much better served by not trying to figure out how to apply that to individual securities and figuring out how to apply that to selecting the advisor who has that approach that you feel most comfortable with and let outsource that to them while you focus on the things in your life that you have to. All right. Well, look, um, in wrapping up here, because I'm, I'm looking and seeing that we're, we're quickly running out of time here. Trades. What trades do you do this this diminished week, if any? Not in this week, just because it's a holiday shortened week. So there's you, you don't ever trade the week of Thanksgiving because there's nobody around. Uh, so it's kind of the inmates running the asylum. Markets can move, you know, kind of willy nilly and doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, we did some tax loss selling the week before um, and we'll pro and we're looking for this pullback, which we think will come in the first two weeks of December. Um, could be as, as far as the 15th of December when the uh, FOMC has their next meeting. But somewhere between now and Christmas, we'll, we'll likely get a pullback and we'll and we'll put some of the cash we've raised to work. OK, and um do you have any planned trades between now and then? Or are you literally sort of in a wait and see holding pattern right now? Um, there's some positions that we own in our portfolio that probably we're just going to be adding to. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Walmart, um, probably Costco, I would imagine. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, we've got a couple of small cap positions that we like. Stanley Black & Decker, which is really starting to perform much better. Um, and, and so there's going to be some areas that we just typically probably just take cash and, and increase those position sizes. Um, you know, but there may be a new position or two that we add, depending on what kind of what's going on. Okay. All right. Well, there were some interesting things I wanted to discuss with you, but we're going to have to punt those to next week, given that we, we, we run a bit long this week. Um, right. very quickly folks, um, thank you for making it all the way through with us again for yet another week. Um, well, it's very happy to be, uh, that these weekly market recaps are back up and running. Um, you know, we were getting tons and tons of, of requests for them over the past couple of weeks. Now that they've started, been getting a lot of love uh, for the fact that they're back. So thank you for, for rejoining with me, re resaddling up with me on these. No um, folks, if you are enjoying these, uh, would love for these to continue and, and maybe even for uh, me to arrange that uh, behavioral economist to come on and chat with Lance on one of these in the near future. Please vote your support of that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. As a reminder, while this channel is still new, um, the subscriber count really does matter in terms of influencing the algorithm. So if for some reason you haven't subscribed yet to this channel, it's totally free. Make sure you hit that subscribe button below and that, that little bell icon. Um, just a reminder, too, that um, I am uh, publishing a lot of supplemental information to these videos through my new Substack. Um, and uh, that's also where when I do the interviews during the week, uh, I'm now sharing my Adams notes. Um, those specifically are going to the premium subscribers who have been helping support this channel. But um, I'm giving lots of information about what we're working on here, what's next for Thoughtful Money. And I will share very quickly the roster of folks coming up uh, next week. So the video after this one, which should come out tomorrow, if you're watching this on Saturday, the day this releases, uh, will be with Ted Oakley. Another great discussion with Ted. He never disappoints. I uh, then have a conversation with Simon Hunt, which I just recorded. That one, folks, I got to warn you, it's probably going to make you want to put your head in the oven. I do try to work with Simon to pull your head out before the end of that interview. <laughs> but it is, it is, It's deep. We'll put it that way. It's heavy. Um, I then uh, was at the New Orleans Investment Conference a couple of weeks ago, and I uh, moderated a panel on the future of money with um, Daniel Martino Booth, Lynn Alden, Jim Rickards, and Russ Gray. Uh, they are kindly letting me uh, run that to you guys for free. So that'll be next Thursday. And then we have Michael Pento coming back on the program. A lot of folks have been asking for him. So we got a great lineup lined ahead. So stay tuned for this coming week. Um, as I wrap up, oh, sorry. And so to go get my, uh, follow me for free uh, on that Substack, just go to adamtaggart.substack.com. Dot com. You'll get all the information there. And again, if you want to get the Adams notes, you can sign up for them there by, by upgrading the premium. Um, all right, Lance, I'll let you have the last word as always, buddy. Nope. Uh, we'll see what happens next week, but I hope, all, uh, I hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving and uh, enjoyed yourself. All right, great. Yeah, I forgot. I should have mentioned this at the very beginning. Um, I can't tell if people can see this sort of puppy eye I have here, but I was uh, roughhousing with one of my dogs last night and got a little more dog in my face than I I was expecting. I think she was just amped up on all the turkey. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> yeah, had a great time. I'm glad to hear you did too. Everybody else, I hope you all had phenomenal Thanksgivings. And um, if you've got uh, the interest, 
Uh, that interview I mentioned with Jesse Felder, really interesting conversation. I'll put up a link to it right here. Lance, thanks so much, buddy. I'll see you next week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.